Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to answer a subscriber's question here on quant conspiracies. So yes, there are quite a few quant conspiracies out there. I'm going to try to clear some things up, make it a little easier to understand. Uh, the question comes from a person here. I'm not going to give away their name, but uh, they said, basically, I heard that many of the big financial firms, you know, like indulging in unethical practices, which result into dividing up a society into, you know, somewhat of a rich and poor, where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, then they go on to say, you know, many quants themselves might not know about what they are doing for their employers, you know, knowing that it's unethical. And that's the reason they're paid so well. And they give an example of, you know, average salary for UK on Glassdoor, 70,000 pounds. And of course, the firms get a ton of money due to unethical practices. And that's why they pay such big amounts. Okay, so let's get down to the reality of this here and try to explain it. So first of all, I'm giving you a US perspective, okay? The United States... Uh, the UK, for example, many developed countries with very, I don't know, advanced financial systems. Uh, there's not a lot of insider secrets and conspiracies going on. Surprise, surprise. There's a ton of regulation. You know, this regulation keeps everybody honest for the most part. And of course, you're going to have a few outliers, right? And anecdotal evidence of, you know, one firm or one issue that came up. But let's talk about the reality of this. So, you need to understand exactly what a model does, how it works. Now, I have a whole video I'm working on. It's gonna take me some time, but an entire video on explaining kind of the evolution of decisioning from mankind. So back from like caveman days, right? And going through history, understanding the developments, looking at it from a modeling perspective as well, and trying to figure out all these little nitty gritty details and how it works. Uh, so the truth is here is no, there's no giant conspiracy. Banks aren't screwing over people. Uh, the media, so let me put this out there, the media and the far left, so the social justice warriors out there, don't understand math and stats and much of the statistics they do provide aren't actual statistics because they take some sort of data set and it tells the wrong story and then they throw away parts of the data until they get the answer they want and then they report those. So, and they never report what they got rid of. So you should be kind of weary of that. Um, now, understanding banking, you know, one of the big complaints comes from why do, you know, the wealthy, why do they get loans? Why do they get better investments? Why do they have all these great opportunities and, you know, the poor people get higher interest rates or they can't get a loan or there's some issue here, okay? This isn't necessarily rich versus poor, so I know it's hard to believe here, but as I've emphasized on many videos here, building models is complex and you should have a model with a large variety of variables. Again, you don't want a million of them because then your model's hard to explain and it's hard to understand. But I mean, a typical credit model should have, I don't know, between 15 and 30 variables on average, right? Depending on usage and all that. And what a model actually does, it looks at a variety of factors. So just imagine yourself, I don't know, say this is a family member. We'll do this as an easy example. Let's say uh, you have a brother and a sister, okay? Your sister, I don't know, is a 4.0 student. She's amazing. Um, you know, she makes decent money. She has a steady job, right? Amazing person in general, just does really well. Your brother, you love him to death, but he's kind of a screw up, you know, he's a really funny guy. He can't hold a job though. And, you know, he struggles to make payments on things. He's already defaulted on a few other car loans, for example. You know, he's renting an apartment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it indicates that he doesn't really have enough funds to buy a house, for example, right? So you have these two candidates. You'd want to look at in a model a lot of different factors, right? Not just income. And models do look at a variety of factors. So, you know, you might look at past performance. So like I mentioned, your brother, maybe he's defaulted on three other car loans and your sister owns one car, right? It's only one car, but she paid off the whole car in full, never had a default, never missed a payment. Uh, you can look at things like FICO score, which again, incorporate a lot of these other factors into that. But you have all these variables you're trying to get about these two candidates, right? Now, as a family member, you already know a lot of nitty gritty details inside of these individuals. So in your case, right, if you had money and let's say your sister came and said, hey, um, I'm doing really well, but my car broke down and I need $1,000 to help fix, I don't know, let's say a rear differential on your car, okay? And then your brother comes to you and says, hey, I have this auto loan, right? I can't make the payments on it. Uh, can you help me, you know, pay for this loan? I need $1,000, right? So it's the same amount, same loan. Who are you going to give the money to? Think about it, right? If you need the $1,000, so you're not a super wealthy individual, right? You have, let's say, $1,000 in savings. That's all you have. You want to get the money back, right? And you want to help both of your siblings, right? You feel really bad on a moral kind of standpoint that your brother's not doing so well. But your sister, right, she also needs it and she can't get to work anymore, right? Who are you going to give 
the thousand dollars to? Well, if your goal is to get the money back, you're gonna give it to your sister, okay? Because you know your sister has a good track record, she has a solid job. If you could give her the money to fix the car, she can go to work, make more money, and pay you back. Your brother, on the other hand, he's behind on his payments because he just doesn't have enough money. And while you feel bad for him, right? Like I wanna help my brother as well, the issue with it is that I'm not gonna get the money back. And at the end of the day, it might help him, you know, patch another month, two months of payments, but you're not gonna get the money back. So I'm gonna be worse off, he might be okay. Whereas the other situation, right? I'm gonna give the money to my sister, she, you know, fixes her car, she drives to work, she pays me back, I don't know, for a few months, and everything's fine and dandy. So two people are better off, right? In these situations, right, you're trying to decide who to give the money to. It makes a lot more sense to give it to the person that's going to pay you back, okay? Because you have limited funds. Now, financial institutions are the exact same. They have a pool of money, it's limited, and they can only make so many loans. And so they need to get that money back. If they don't get the money back, right, they can't make any more loans. They might make, you know, let's say they make a thousand loans, and if everyone defaulted, then the bank goes bankrupt and nobody gets more loans. If you're able to make loans and get money back, you can keep making more loans over and over and over again. So it's actually a larger benefit to society as well, okay? So this is kind of how banks work, but you have to do it on a mass scale and it has to be very equal and fair. And in doing so, right, you need to build models that are predictive, but not discriminatory. So again, having money is one of those indicators that you're probably gonna be able to pay it back. But there are a lot of other variables and models that I mentioned a, variable, a model can have around 30 variables, maybe even more sometimes, depending on what type of model it is. Uh, but again, you want to get the money back. So that's really how banks work. And banks specialize also in subprime. So let's say you have your risky brother and let's say I have, I don't know, $2,000, that's all I have to my name. I give a thousand to my sister and I wanna help out my brother. And so I give him a thousand dollars as well, right? You still have a probability you'll get something back. Banks actually specialize in you know markets where you help poorer people. A lot of banks do it to diversify their portfolios. But again, you have to charge a higher rate because if you made a lot of loans to a lot of people that are really high risk, you need to make sure that the number of people defaulting, right? So that money that you lost from making loans is going to be smaller than the amount of interest you get back so you can keep making loans, right? Banks will lose money. They won't be able to actually, you know, pay out loans. So that's kind of the rich versus poor, kind of how loans work, understanding banks here. Quants are just building models to do this. We actually ensure there is fairness and equality. There are lots of regulations that tie into this as well. So things that we can and can't use inside of models, which is really good. I'm a big proponent of a lot of the regulations we have. But again, there's no secret thing going behind the scenes. And then to wrap this video up, why are quants paid so well? Well, it's required to have a master's or a PhD. So the amount of education that you need to actually break into the field is higher. Now, the reason for this is you need to be very technical, right? Imagine somebody builds a terrible model and discriminates against everybody, and it makes all these loans to your friends and your cronies and everything, but you don't actually make loans to the average public, right? You might not even know that from a modeling perspective, and so you wanna make sure that there's a really good model. So you want to get good models, you gotta pay for good talent. Uh, to build just the basics, you need at minimum a master's, if not a PhD education level in like statistics and quant finance to be able to do that. Uh, you can't expect a student to go out and pay, you know, so for example, I paid $70,000 in tuition just for my tuition for my master's and then expect me to make the same amount of money as somebody else who has a bachelor's degree for a different job that's quite similar. Or let's say you have a bunch of quant jobs that require a bachelor's, right? No one's going to go get the master's. They're just going to go for the bachelor degree. So you have to pay more since you're requiring more of them. That's why quants make more. 70,000 pounds is not really that much for the quant realm. So... I mean, starting, yeah, it's about average. I mean, the United States is obviously a little bit higher here, uh, but that's not a crazy amount of money for the amount of skills, effort, and requirement that the company is requiring of the individual. So anyways, I'm hoping you guys understand. I've kind of busted that myth. Again, this is for you know well-developed countries. If you have corruption in your country, this could be happening, right? There could be some sort of like flag in a model that essentially allows different people of different classes to be able to get loans versus other ones that are not. This is not the case in the United States. I know this is not the case in the UK. Um, so again, if you're in another country, it's possible, but you know, in the majority of these quant jobs, the majority of these countries, it's not true. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, or subscribe. And as always, until next time.